Hello, Pure Art family. So glad that you could join us online today. Now this week, Pastor Dan's starting a brand new series. I was blank, and now I am blank. Interesting title, huh? Well, this series, we're gonna be focusing on the redemption that God can do in our lives. And we're gonna be sharing some really powerful stories that are gonna showcase God's restoration really to those areas of brokenness that so many people experience. Also, Daylight Savings Time is coming. Now, if you live in the rest of the country, you probably celebrate Daylight Savings Time and half the year, you're really happy because you gain an hour of sleep and the other half, you're really annoyed because you lost an hour of sleep. But Arizona is a bit of a weird place. And we don't do Daylight Savings Time here. I'm not kidding, it's weird. So starting Sunday, March 14th on our Facebook page, we're gonna start premiering Sundays at 10 a.m. East Coast, 10 a.m. West Coast. That way for the rest of the country, you guys can keep up with us. And for everyone else in Arizona, on Arizona time, that's gonna be a 7 a.m. and a 10 a.m. Facebook premiere times. Saturday nights, we'll continue to broadcast on all platforms at 5.30 p.m. Arizona time. That's gonna be Pacific time then. On our website, we'll keep existing Arizona broadcast times. So I know that's a little bit confusing, but the only change is for Facebook premieres, Sundays, 10 a.m. East Coast, 10 a.m. West Coast. And of course, the service is always available on demand after Saturday night, so you can watch it whenever. Then also, can you believe it? Easter is coming. Last year was crazy. COVID closed our physical campuses. So Easter, we did totally online. But this year, Lord willing, we'll be having physical services on our Glendale and Peoria campuses, multiple services, along with our online broadcasts. And you know what we realize is that people have, have struggled. And this last year over COVID has been such a hard year. And we're gonna be believing that more people are open to hearing about the love of Christ more than ever before. So invite those friends, invite your family to watch online with you, or if you're local and comfortable with coming to a physical campus, invite them with you. Go on our website, pureheart.org, for all the information on all those service times for our physical campuses. So let's take this time together, refocus, encourage our hearts, cast out fear and lies from our minds, and we're gonna lean in, open your Bible, open your Bible app, and then we're gonna take this time for our hearts to be encouraged. So this year, let's worship together, let's get healthy together, become more like Jesus for the sake of others. Welcome to church. Hey, what's up, Pure Art family? Thanks so much for joining us online today. Hey, no matter where you find yourself, we're gonna worship and we're gonna praise our God. He's worthy of it today. So come on, let's do it together. Come on.
There's nothing worth more That will ever come close No thing can compare Your living home Your presence Tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is under your prayer. family. So our first gathering of Covenant City Church and Pure Heart Church as two congregations coming together, it broadcast this last Sunday night. Now, not only was the worship amazing, but seeing the two congregations coming together and celebrating unity in Christ, there really isn't words. It was oh, so good. So let's just say God showed up in a really, really powerful way. Pastor Dan, Pastor Patrick shared vision that God's laid on both of their hearts for our new United Congregation at our Peoria campus. And also Pastor Patrick preached this last weekend on prayer. So if you missed either Patrick's sermon or had not seen the prayer and worship night, I wanna encourage you to go back and watch them. This is something that's so important. I believe that you're going to be blessed. So go to Pure Heart's YouTube channel or in the Pure Heart app and check those out. And now family, let's focus our hearts, lean into what God wants to do in our lives today as we remember that the church, it's not a building. Thank you for joining us online today. We have the absolute privilege of speaking into your life, encouraging you today. We know there's so many things flying at you in this world, so many things bringing you down. We just wanna lift you up. 
and encourage you today and let you know that you matter to God. You were created on purpose. There's nobody else on planet Earth just like you. You were born for a mission. Thank you for being with us today. Over 150 countries are now tuning in online. All 50 states, every weekend, people are joining us, growing online. Not just on the weekends, tuning in all throughout the week. Thank you for making the choice to grow with us. We are humbled by that. We know you have so many choices, so many great leaders to listen to, so many churches you could tune in with. Thank you for growing with us. Have a strong day. Welcome into our brand new series, I Was, But Now I Am. Crossroads Recovery, we love you guys so much. So proud of you for each day, taking greater and greater steps towards freedom. We're, we're just praying for you and believing that you're going to continue to trust God and find the strength that you're looking for. We know that you can find in Christ. Also, those of you watching all around the world, thank you for tuning in today, watching all around our country. And then here in Arizona, those of you who may be not quite comfortable yet coming back on campus, thank you for tuning in. Know that we miss you. But uh, stay safe, stay strong, stay healthy, and thank you so much for being a part of the service today. So here we go. When our kids were little, we used to go over to our friend's home in California all the time. We'd drive over there every summer to hang out. We would take two or three weeks just to decompress and enjoy life, go to the beach. One year as we were driving to California, we realized that we didn't have a bathing suit for one of our kids. We're like, oh man. So we stopped into Mervyn's. Anybody remember Mervyn's? Everything was always on sale at Mervyn's. Jewelry was always 70% off at Mervyn's. Here's the deal. If something's always 70% off, that's actually the real price. There's a reason that Mervyn's went out of business. So we stopped into Mervyn's, um, and we were walking around the store, and my boys came across this rack of tank tops. And Luke found this tank top he absolutely loved. And on the tank top, it said, cool story, bro. And he just thought that was the greatest tank top ever. Cool story, bro. And he wore it all the time. I think he wore it every day that summer until it was just a worn rag of a shirt that I used to wash the car with. He loved that shirt. And so as I was thinking about that t-shirt and diving into this series, I was, but now I am, I was thinking about this word cool. And so I looked it up and here, here's a part of the definition. These three words jumped off the page to me. Three words, attractive, impressive, and excellent. Attractive, impressive, and excellent. Everybody has a story. But what makes our story cool? What, what makes our story attractive, impressive, and excellent? I, I would say it's not so much a what makes our story, because we have a lot of what in our story. I believe it's a who that makes our story truly cool, truly attractive, truly impressive, and truly excellent. Jesus is the who who makes my story Cool. He makes my story impressive. He makes my story the one that people that listen to my story, what he has done in my life, like, my goodness, you were here, but now you're here. Look at the change that's happened in your life. His love, his power, his hope has transformed my life. Otherwise, my shirt would simply say, hot mess story, bro. That's what my shirt would say. I want to show you the key motive to how Jesus makes our story cool. It's found in the beginning of John the Baptist's story, the, the announcement of the birth of John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus, who was proclaiming the coming of the Messiah, who would actually baptize Jesus literally into his mission. John the Baptist's father is a priest, and he was on duty at the temple, and he was, he was serving before the altar, and an angel of the Lord, an angel shows up, Gabriel, one account says Gabriel, Gabriel shows up, and he shares with Zechariah that in his old age, he and his wife, because they hadn't been able to have children, are going to have a son. And they're going to name him John. And so Zechariah comes out from the temple. Everybody can tell that something powerful has happened. And in Luke chapter 1, verse 66, listen to what said the people were saying. Everyone who heard about it reflected on these events and asked, what will this child turn out to be? What will this child's story be? For the hand of the Lord was surely upon him in a special way. And now when Zechariah was able to, he was able to speak. It's a long story. I can't get into it right now. In verse 67, Zechariah begins to speak and he begins to prophesy. And here's what he says. Then his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit 
and gave this prophecy. Zechariah says these words, praise the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has visited and here it is. Here's the key. Here's the motive. Here's why Jesus came. Here's why he makes my story cool. He makes my story powerful, impressive, excellent, attractive. He came and he redeemed his people. Say that word with me. Redeemed. Say it again. Redeemed. He redeemed his people. The definition of redemption, the definition to redeem <clears throat> means these things. To pay a ransom for. To set free. To heal to make whole, to restore, to pay a debt, to save, to make amends for. I really believe this series, that God is going to use it to prepare us to truly celebrate Easter in four weeks. Four weeks from now, as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, and we celebrate the most amazing story ever, as we get ready to celebrate that story, this series is going to get our hearts ready to share and to celebrate what Easter is truly all about. About. And I'm praying that you will invite people to church this Easter like never before. You'll invite them to our online campus. If they're not comfortable coming to church, you'll invite them to our online campus. That maybe all over the world, you'll gather in groups and celebrate the resurrection of Jesus together. Invite all the people that you're in contact, all of your friends, to come and listen to the greatest story ever told. Because people are in need of hope right now like never before. Every day we're sold fear. We're sold fear daily on a daily basis. We need to know. So many people need to know who holds tomorrow because so many people are like, what is going to happen tomorrow? What else is going to happen in our world? They need to know who holds their tomorrow. They need Jesus like never before. This is the best time to invite people to come to church, Easter time. And so we would love for you to invite people, gather together, and we're going to have a great time celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. So let me give you an outline to help you with this cool redemption story, the story of redemption that Jesus came to do in each one of our lives. Let me give you some framework for it, if you will. And my, my, my encouragement to you is that going forward, as we go through this series, going forward, you will begin to share what Jesus has done in your life like never before. Because the only thing greater than you coming to know Jesus is you having the privilege of leading someone else to Jesus. There is nothing like it. To see somebody, their heart, their mind light up with the knowledge and the understanding of how much God loves them. And we're going to hear more about that later on in this message. There's nothing more powerful than leading somebody to the knowledge of the saving grace, the loving grace, the kindness of God through His Son, Jesus Christ. And so here's the framework I want to give you. I was but now I am. When we're sharing our story, we're sharing what Jesus has done, that's a simple framework. Simply, I was. Here's where my life was. Then Jesus entered the picture, and here's where I am today. I was, but now I am. When Nicole and I first got married, my father had a business where he would buy uh, foreclosed, run-down, beat-up, broken homes. He would buy them, he would remodel them, he would fix them up, and then he would flip them as they would, he would sell them. And it was, a, it was an interesting business because for Nicole and I, it was a huge blessing when we first got married because we moved into one of the homes that my dad had purchased. And in every home that my father bought, every single home, we always found drug paraphernalia. Drugs and poverty, drugs and foreclosure go hand in hand. Drugs and brokenness go hand in hand. And my brother's listening today at Crossroads Recovery. Can I get an amen from you today? You understand the brokenness of drugs, of numbing out from life. And so we would we'd go into these homes and they would be a disaster. The home that Nicole and I bought for my father that he fixed up for us was such a disaster when we bought it that we literally took shovels and we shoveled garbage down the hallway into a dumpster outside. We had to shovel garbage out of the house. The refrigerator, when they opened it, it was the smell was so bad that my dad, actually my brother and my father both, when they opened it, they went into the backyard and they got sick to their stomachs. It was disgusting. There were roaches everywhere. Uh, in the backyard, as we were cleaning it up, there was a giant piece of plywood up against the wall, the block wall. I moved the plywood to go throw it into the back of a truck to throw it away. When I moved it, roaches just boom everywhere. There were thousands of roaches and they were huge roaches. So big that one night I was walking to the electrical box because a, a fuse had blown in our house. I was walking to the electrical box and as I'm walking, I hear, I hear footsteps. This is no joke. I'm not, being, I'm not exaggerating. 
I turn around with my flashlight, boom, on the tree. There is a cockroach so big, I literally could hear it walking up the tree. Disgusting. They would come up out of the drain, and we used to have to pour bleach down our drains to just kill them out, to keep them from coming up into our house. Now, as you can imagine, my wonderful wife, Nicole, who is now nine months pregnant when we moved into this house, standing in the kitchen, cleaning out the oven that was filthy, tears rolling down her face. Not tears of joy. <laughs> tears of, why would my husband move me into a house like this? And I went, baby, right now, your husband, this is all we can afford. We are redeeming this house. I tried to cast a vision of what it was going to look like. And at the moment, she couldn't see it. But oh my goodness, that house turned out beautiful. We gutted that place, redid all the walls, redid the carpeting, cleaned up the backyard. And that place that was an absolute disaster turned into a place of some of the greatest memories of our lives. You see, our first home's redemption, redemption story, I was, but now I am, would simply be this. I was trashed, but now I am a treasured memory. Nicole and I will actually, every once in a while, we'll drive by that house. It's over here on 33rd Avenue in Thunderbird. We'll drive by it, and we'll sit out front of the house, and we'll reminisce about how all three of our kids were born to us while we lived in that home. We dream, we, we reminisce about family gatherings and having, we had our, Nicole's entire family, like 50 Italians in our backyard in this little 1120 square foot house. We had everybody over at our house. It is a treasured memory. I think about our Glendale campus in Glendale, Arizona, and, and what it looked like when we first bought it. It was a disaster. It was an absolute disaster. As a matter of fact, it was so bad, our neighbors across the street from the church, their property values went up $10,000 per home just when we cleaned up the trash on the property. But now, all these years later, 16 years later, 7,000 people have committed their lives to Jesus on this campus. And, and, and you'll see some of the pictures coming across of what it looked like before and what it looks like now. It's been amazing transformation as God has allowed us to redeem this property and to set it free, to clean it up, to ransom it, if you will, and turn it into something that is literally changing our community. Now flowing from this campus is love for schools, love for the poor, love for those dealing with food scarcity, love for those who are dealing with addiction and broken marriages and singles who find themselves in deep loneliness. They're finding redemption and hope for their lives. So much has ha happened on this campus. The Pure Heart Glendale campus's redemption story is I was abandoned, and now thousands of people have been adopted into God's family. It's a story of redemption. When I look at our Peoria campus over in Peoria, and you, know, you see some pictures of what it looked like when it was given to us. It was a campus that was, at the time, a few years ago, was struggling to grow. Uh, the church that was there at the time, was, they were struggling to grow. They, it was in decline. Um, they were getting older and older, and then they gifted this campus to us. They gave it to us as a gift. And now Covenant City and Pure Heart Church are coming together on that campus, and we're going to be doing our grand relaunch of that campus coming up on Easter weekend. And the Pure Heart Peoria campus's redemption story is this. I was falling behind, that campus would cry out, and now I'm a forerunner of unity in the city of Phoenix. I was falling behind. Now I get to be a forerunner of unity. We love redemption stories. But bigger than buildings and properties is the redemption of human lives. When Jesus comes into our story and takes what was broken and heals it and makes it whole and sets us free into our new purpose found in him. The greatest story of redemption is not just properties, not just homes and churches, but human souls. We're going to be telling some stories throughout this series. Our first story comes from Bree Stewart. Here's part one of her amazing redemption story. I was born into a Mormon family. I was baptized when I was eight years old in the Mormon faith. And for me, I started questioning it very early, even before my baptism, not knowing who Joseph Smith was, why do I have to just go get married and have a child, and what is baptisms for the dead? So I left when I was 13 because I didn't want to believe in something that I didn't have faith in. I then moved to California, didn't have faith, and then went off to college at GCU to find my faith. When I was a freshman, I lived on campus. I got to live in the dorms and be a part of life groups, which is small groups on campus, and that's where I was gifted my first Bible. At that time, I started really discovering who Jesus was in my own personal relationship, where I didn't before. 
and I chose to be baptized in April of 2013 on Easter because that significance of him dying for me was the reason why I wanted to give my life to him. So after about four years at GCU, I was on fire in and out going with different groups and going to church and the church that I was a part of disbanded. The pastor just said, I'm not doing this anymore, goodbye. And instead of appointing another person to lead the church, he just left. And that left me heartbroken because I didn't know where to go from there. I would never had that happen in my life and I felt like my community was crumbling. I was graduating college without a church and so instead of turning to God, I turned to alcohol. I turned to partying, drugs, and I was sexually assaulted a few times because of those bad decisions. I had been questioning for a while when I was partying if God was still in my life, and I had to learn the hard way that He was. It wasn't until my DUI on my 25th birthday that everything changed. I didn't hurt myself or anyone else, and I'm so grateful for that, but it was the wake-up call I really did need for Him to tell me that He's here. We're going to get to more of Bree's story a little later on in the message. Now, I want you to open your Bibles with me to the New Testament, to the letter to the Ephesian church, to Ephesians chapter one. I'm gonna be there in just a moment. The apostle Paul is the writer of this letter to the church in Ephesus. Paul's writing to his dear friends who he loves greatly in the Lord, has a great partnership and ministry with them. And listen, if you don't know Paul's story, uh, if anyone ever needed redemption, If anyone ever needed to be made whole, to be redeemed, to be set free, to be forgiven, it was Paul. Uh, Paul, before he was Paul, was known as Saul. Uh, He was up and coming religious leader. Um, And you think religious leader, he'd be a pretty good guy. But Paul would have Christians imprisoned and he had Christians murdered. Matter of fact, there's one, one moment in the book of Acts where Stephen, the first martyr that we know of in the New Testament, Stephen is being beaten with rocks to death. And Paul is standing off to the side, giving the order for his execution and watching the cloaks that were laying at his feet. This was not a great man. This was a man on high ambition. This was a man who did some atrocious things to human beings. He would actually be known today as a religious terrorist before he met Jesus. Like, like if you're in a group of friends and you're kind of, maybe you've done this, you kind of go around and you tell your story about before you met Jesus and what your life was like before Jesus. And everybody's kind of one-upping, well, man, well, I did this, and man, I did this, and here's where I was at. If Paul was in that group, when he got done telling his story, everybody in the group would be like, yeah, you win. You, 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 you actually have the worst story. If anyone ever needed redemption, it was Paul. And in this letter to the Ephesian church, Paul writes the most amazing account of Jesus' redemption, of what he has done in our lives that you can find in the New Testament. It is absolutely beautiful. And I hope it impacts your heart today as much as it has my heart over this last week as I've been studying through this section of Scripture in chapter 1, verses 3 through 8, and really letting it get deep into my heart. Paul lays out in detail how Jesus impacted his story. And not just his story. It's, it's, I love the way he writes this under the power of the Holy Spirit. He writes us to include all of us. All of us. So, so watch what he says. Let's start in verse 3 of chapter 1 of Ephesians. It says this, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us. I love that word has, meaning it's a done deal. We are blessed to be a blessing. Who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Not, 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 not like we bless each other here on earth. You sneeze, bless you. Right? No, no, this is a spiritual blessing. This is, a, this is an elevated blessing. This is a beautiful, holy blessing. With every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms, because, so why are we so blessed? He says it, because we are united We have become one with Christ. So we're blessed to be a blessing because of our relationship with Jesus. Now Paul goes on. This gets so good. He says, even before, everybody say before. Come on, say it again. Before, Even before he made the world, God loved us. Now, when our three kids were born, there was a moment when I truly fell in love with them. And it actually happened before. Before they were born. When I first fell in love with our three kids, especially my son Josh, it happened the moment I heard his heartbeat. And, and I'll, never, I'll never forget it. We were, we were living in Prescott, Arizona at the time, and we worked at the United Christian Youth Camp in Prescott, Arizona. And so um, we went, found out we were pregnant, and, 
you know, the time went by and the doctor said, hey, you can come in. We're going to do a little ultrasound. We're going to listen for the baby's heartbeat. And I'll never forget the room. It was this really small room. I remember going in, so I was sitting in a chair and the, the, the nurse came in and she had this little machine and she put it on Nicole, like pulled down Nicole, she pulled up her shirt and kind of pulled down her pants just enough to expose her abdomen. And then she started to rub some gel on this little wand and then she put it right on the, Nicole's stomach and she kind of went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And I heard these gurgling sounds and all kinds of stuff going on. And then I heard it. And I'm like, what is that? Sounds like an old-fashioned washing machine that my grandma had down in the basement. She goes, that's it. I go, what's it? She goes, you hear that? I go, yeah, that whoosh sound. She goes, yeah. She goes, that's your baby's heartbeat. It was right there in that moment. I absolutely fell in love with our firstborn, Josh. Same Same thing happened with Luke. Same thing with Abigail. That first moment, matter of fact, with Luke, we got, I got to watch his little heartbeat flutter on the ultrasound. It was so amazing, so powerful, so beautiful. That's when I first fell in love with him. And the Apostle Paul, just, just follow me with for a second. The Apostle Paul's like, God the Father loved Josh, Luke, and Abigail. Not just before they were born. Not just before they were conceived. Not even before you and Nicole were even born. Your grandparents, when they came over from Germany and Italy, your great-grandparents from Germany and Italy, he loved Josh, Luke, and Abigail before Italy and Germany were even created. Before the foundations of the earth. God loved you. That is so powerful. I don't even know if you can fully get your mind around that. When nothing existed except God himself, he loved me. He loves you. And now it gets even deeper. Now it gets foundational. It gets soul identity level for just a moment. Have you ever felt like you just weren't enough? You just didn't measure up. You you, you just weren't enough. And listen to what Paul says next. He goes on, verse 4, he says this, and, and not only did he love you before he even made the world, and he chose you, which in the Greek means literally to select. He picked you. He selected you in Christ to be, I love this next word, holy, which means to be set apart for a specific purpose, for a plan. Do you remember in grade school growing up when they would pick teams at PE or at recess? Man, I hated that, especially about fifth and sixth grade. My body was changing. I had put on some extra weight, and I was kind of an awkward kid. I wasn't a very good athlete at that time. And I remember just, they'd go around, they'd pick this kid, pick this kid. They always picked two captains. I never got to be the captain. They would pick the different kids for the teams, and you were just always like, please don't pick me last. Please don't pick me last. And Paul's like, he selected you. He chose you. And not because he felt sorry for you. Were you ever picked because you knew somebody felt bad for you? That happened to me a couple times in school. He picked me, okay, I'll take him. He's the last one there. I'll, I'll take him. No, no, he didn't pick me because he felt sorry for me. Paul says, in Christ, he chose me He selected me to be holy, meaning that he picked me to have an impactful purpose. He chose me to contribute to his team, to his family, to his kingdom. He chose me on purpose because he loved me before the foundations of the world were even created to actually make a difference, to play a role, a holy part in his kingdom. You matter. You are enough. You belong to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, Paul is saying. And then he goes on. If you've ever felt like you didn't measure up, maybe in your father's eyes or in your mother's eyes or in some of your parents, in your kid's eyes or at somebody at work or your boss's eyes, this next statement is so powerful. Verse four, he continues, says this, and without fault in his eyes, he chose you in Christ to be holy and to be without fault in his eyes. Eyes. This is crazy. This literally means directly in front of, in his eyes, also translated in his sight, to be directly in front of. What is Paul saying here? He's saying this when Father God looks at me, he sees his son, he sees Jesus. He doesn't see my imperfections, he sees the perfection of Christ. 
the sinlessness of Christ, the faultlessness of Jesus, that in my broken life, Jesus stands between me and the Father. And when the Father looks at me in his holiness and his perfection, he sees Jesus covering my life. Healing my life. Redeeming my life. Taking all the garbage and the brokenness and putting it back together in a purposeful way. When my God sees me, he sees his perfect son in me. I'll say it this way. He doesn't see who I am not. He sees whose I am. I belong to Jesus. I'm God's child. I move from his creation to his child because of my relationship with his son, Jesus Christ. That's what God sees when he sees me. He doesn't see my brokenness. He sees all my, my mistakes and my sin and my rebellion. He sees the perfection of his son being formed in me. Jesus literally stands in front of me and he covers my broken life. He has redeemed me. He has set me free. He has healed me. And he has given me a story that's impressive and excellent and attractive to my father. So cool. Cool story, bro. The coolest story, bro. Now, it goes on from here. It gets even deeper. It says this, And God decided in advance, I love that, to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Christ Jesus. Before I ever did anything adorable, God planned my adoption. Matter of fact, Paul writes it in Romans in kind of the opposite way. He says that while I was still a sinner, God demonstrated his great love for me in this, that while I was still a sinner, Christ died for me. Before I did anything adorable, before I did anything worthy of being loved, God already chose in advance. He made a decision ahead of time to adopt me into his family, to adopt you into his family through Jesus Christ, through his Son. Growing up, because of the way the Stefan family loves people, I, I love the way, I've always admired the way my mom and dad cared for people. Um, my dad has an incredible mercy gift. He has an incredible gift of, of just pure love for people. Um, so much so that a lot of the neighbor kids over the years, they started calling my dad, dad. Which I have to admit, when I was younger, it was kind of annoying. Like, he's not your dad, he's, he's, he's my dad. You know, but they, they would always call him dad. Uh, matter of fact, we had one young man. His name was Ryan. Um, he was my brother, Paul's uh, good friend growing up. And Ryan Hahn. Ryan, Ryan uh, had a, just a great friendship with my father. Um, matter of fact, there were times when Ryan would call my dad to help him with things before he even talked to his own dad. My dad would have to say, have you talked to your dad about this yet? Have you communicated with your parents about this yet? Um, matter of fact, one time in the middle of the night, it was probably like midnight, Ryan showed up at our house to get my dad to help him with his dog. My dad goes over to their house. He's helping Ryan with his dog that was sick, and he realizes that his own father is home in the house. He's like, "Why are you, your biological dad's right here. Why aren't, why aren't you involving him in this situation? And, and I've always thought to myself, why is it? How, what, what happened that uh, outside of just the love that my parents had for people and the way my dad took care of Ryan, what is it? How did that take place? And I thought, what would, ever, what would have happened if, when Ryan first showed up to our house, the very first day he showed up to our house, imagine if Ryan showed up to our house by himself on his little bike, knocked on the door, and said, my dad answered, and Ryan said, hey, how you doing? And I was just in the neighborhood, I thought I'd stop by. My dad would go, young man, where, where's your home? Where's your parents? And my dad would have taken Ryan back to his house and made sure he was okay and reconnected him with his father. But Ryan didn't show up to the Stefan front door by himself. Ryan showed up to the Stefan front door with my brother Paul, my father's son. And it's because of my father's son Paul that Ryan was allowed into the home. And because of my father's, because of Paul, my father's son's relationship with Ryan, today Ryan calls my dad, dad. No one comes to the Father 
No one comes to the Father except through the Son. This adoption, this love, this redemption, this healing of our lives all happens because of our relationship with the Son of God, the very Son of God. I've become a child of God because of my relationship with the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And because of that, I now call the creator of the universe Father. And so here's part two of Bree's story. When I got my DUI, I was ashamed. I cried a lot. If it wasn't for Pastor Brian Bloom and Arthur Brown coming to me and letting me know that it's okay to not be okay, I don't know where I'd be right now. I actually had made a suicide attempt um, during that time. And when I was struggling after my DUI, I would go and talk to Pastor Brian and he told me to come to church. I came that week and Pastor Dan was asking if anybody wants to have Jesus be the leader of your life. I raised my hand so high and I just knew that that was the time. I had been questioning if he was real and active in my life and him saving me in that awful instance was when I knew he was the leader of my life and I needed to back my trust into that. I spent eight days in jail and I was actually preaching my testimony because I realized that he had changed my heart for the better and I wanted others to experience that. I had to go to like 36 hours of DUI counseling for alcohol abuse and I realized a lot of things about my life at that time too. He has shown me that I am not myself without him. I know what I'm like without God and without Christ in my life and I don't like who that person is. My demeanor, my conviction, my love for other people is different than when I wasn't a believer. I want to spread the gospel because I want others to know how I feel. And I feel his joy, I feel his peace and his presence in my life and I want other people to feel that. And since he saved me in that moment, in my accident, I know that he exists. And I know that he's watching over me. So let's go back to Paul's story of Jesus' redemption story for just a couple more verses. Verse 5. So, so Paul, why, why, did, why did God the Father do this? Why, why did Jesus do this? What was his motive? And I love what Paul says in verse 5. This is so good. He says, this is what he wanted to do. Isn't that excellent? Isn't that impressive? This is what he wanted to do. Isn't that so cool? This is what he wanted to do. It's not what he had to do. It's what he wanted to do, Paul said. That was the motive of Paul's Paul said, this is what God the Father, this is what he wanted to do. Have you ever had somebody do something for you and you just felt like they felt that you just felt like they felt like they didn't want to do it? Have you ever just wrestled with that? Like you weren't quite sure if they really wanted to do that? Did they really care about doing that? Or were they just doing it because they felt obligated to do something nice for you? Um, it, it, it's like God saying to, to one of the angels, listen. I created him. I better go down there and fix that mess. All right? No. That's not why he did it. That's not why he came into our broken world. He came because he wanted to. And this is what Paul goes on to say in verse 5. He says, and, this is so good, and it gave him great pleasure. Think about that. It gave him great pleasure to love us this much, to send his one and only son, to lay down his life for us, to pay a price that we couldn't pay for ourselves. It gave him great pleasure pleasure to redeem us. I was, but now I am. It gave him great pleasure to build that story for each and every one of us. I have a good friend. His name is Clint. Clint has this amazing ability. It's a grace of God ability to always be generous to me in such a way that it was like I was giving him a great pleasure that I was blessing him greatly so that he could bless me. It's, it's the wildest thing. He just has this amazing way of blessing me. And he has done some extravagant things for my wife and I. And he has blessed us tremendously. But it's almost like I did him a favor by letting him be generous to me. It's like I almost walk away from the conversation sometimes going, wow, that was really nice of me to let him bless me that way. I mean, he just has the ability to do that. He wanted to do this, is what Paul said. And it gave him great pleasure. And then Paul goes on, verse 6. It says, so we praise God for his glorious <clears throat> grace. He poured out on us who belong to his dear son. This word praise carries with it the idea of declaring. 
to declare, to tell our story, to praise God, to tell the good things, to tell the impressive and excellent things that he has done, the cool things that he has done in our lives to create our story in Christ. Look at this conclusion. Look at what he says here next in verse verse 8, 7 and 8. He says, he is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased, that word purchased literally means redeemed, He redeemed our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. And then this part is so beautiful. He has showered his kindness on us. He has showered. He has showered down his kindness. Paul said, as he's grappling for words, as the Holy Spirit's moving his heart and he's writing this letter, like, what do I want to say? What do I want to say? What do I want to say? One translation says lavished. He has lavished on us. He has showered on us. The only way I can say it, just his kindness. His goodness to me. When we were in California, my wife and I, two years ago, we had a chance to be there kind of by ourselves, um, which some of the, the, some of the best trips when it's just my beautiful wife and I. And so we were going through some shops in Newport, and I said going through because we couldn't afford anything there. <laughs> we were going through and looking at it and like, oh, look at that. Okay, that's a little bit expensive. And we went into this bakery because um, we like bakeries. And so we stopped in this bakery and um, getting ready to buy a th- couple of things. And we were looking around the store. They had this um, lunchbox that said, shower kindness like confetti. I just thought it was so cool. Shower kindness like confetti or spread kindness like confetti. And so we laughed about that. I was like, what a great statement. And um, Nicole, this last year, as she was getting ready to go back to work at Cactus High School, she said to me, she goes, Dan, I really feel like the Lord wants to put a theme in my heart for this year. It's been such a difficult year with the pandemic, and some kids are online, and some kids are in class, and teachers are kind of overwhelmed by trying to do both. And um, administration is, every day has so much extra work they have to do with protocols. And it's just a crazy year. Parents are extra hot, extra upset. Every once in a while, she'll have to call a, call a whole room full of uh, kids as parents and tell them they have to come pick up your kids because somebody was exposed to COVID-19. It was just a brutal, brutal year, um, especially in the fall. And, and she said, I, I just, I want a theme. I feel like God is going to give me a theme as I go back to school. And this is a theme she came up with. It was from our trip. Spread kindness like confetti. And so she put some confetti around her desk and she put a sign up by her desk. She made a sign that says, spread kindness like confetti. And it's kind of been her due north this year. It's kind of been her directional statement, uh, her mission statement, as she's loving parents and loving teachers and loving administrators as they come through. She works at the front desk. She's the first face of Cactus. It's kind of just been her statement to spread kindness like confetti. And what motivates my wife to do this is because Jesus himself has spread kindness like confetti and showered kindness all over her soul and all over her life. He's taken some of the most broken areas of her life, the passing of her mom. At 54 years of age, the night before Luke was born, some of the most broken, painful, lonely places of her life, he's put them back together in such a beautiful way. He's been so good to her, and so kind to her in her grief. Over the years, as he's healed her of so many things, that she herself is like, you know what? I want to take this kindness that's been showered on me. And I want to extend that. I want to shower that on the people around me. I want to pour out the kindness of God on people around me. You see, we all have a redemption story, a story of healing and wholeness. I was, but now I am. I was, but because of Jesus, now I am. Here's the third and final part. A Bree Stewart story. I realized that I needed to get back out and serve and help others because there were people out here that were helping me. And since April of last year, I've been serving in the Resource Center here at Pure Heart Glendale, and it's been the best thing that's ever happened. I've met some really great friends. Arthur and Angel and Pastor Bob are some of my closest friends, and we got to go on the Navajo Nation mission trip together. and. I just so appreciate them loving me with open arms and giving me the opportunity to give back to the people in need. Every week getting to see new people come in for food and blessing them with opportunities so that they can have a better life is so inspiring. 
And then earlier in January this year, I got involved with the Emotionally Healthy Spirituality course that's being led by Pastor John. And that has totally just changed the way that I view my relationship with God in a different way. It's just been so great to see fellowship, to understand that I'm not alone. Um, every week we read in the Bible too of all the different individuals who are going through these things as well. And I think that just always continues to bring it back for me that no matter what, we always have not only the Bible, we always have Jesus. He's using me in, in a variety of ways to, to say who He is to others. And whatever that looks like, if it's serving or if it's me being able to be at the grocery store and share a smile, I really feel like when I'm joyful, I know that that's His joy. My dad in California, he's been very inspired. He's agnostic at this time, and he's been watching how much I've been serving here at, at Pure Heart, and he said when he retires, he wants to come down here and, and serve here too. So that's been really inspiring because I never thought that he would want to come to church. He came with me to Christmas Eve in 2019, um, but that he wants to serve, that tells me that God is working in my life. God is showing his love for his people through me. For me, this is where I know I'm home. I know I belong here. I know that God is real, that He's continuing to watch over me and my family, and I wouldn't change it any other way. Listen, as we wrap up week one of this three-part series, I just want to remind you, all of us who call on the name of Jesus, all of us who would say, I'm a follower of Christ, all of us have a Jesus story. And the people around your life, especially those who are far from God, dealing with fear and anxiety, depression, dealing with all kinds of wondering what tomorrow's gonna hold, they need your Jesus story right now more than ever before. I'm calling us as a community of people who love Jesus, I'm calling us as boldly as I can this leading into this Easter to begin to share our Jesus story with others, to share the good works that he has done, the redemption that he has brought into our broken lives and how he has put us back together on purpose for a purpose. I'm challenging us to do it this year like never before. See, because every one of you listening to this message today, every single one of you, whether you're a follower of Jesus or not, every one of you has a Jesus story. The Bible's so clear. Jesus died once for all. No greater love than this than to lay down your life for another. Everybody has the Jesus story that's simply this. The story is this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Every single person has a Jesus story. And for some of us, unfortunately, the story ends with Jesus loves you. The question is, what will you do with that love? Will you love him in return? And so we never want to end one of our services without giving you the opportunity to make the most important decision of your life to love Jesus in return, to commit your life to him, to accept his love for you, and to respond with Jesus, I wanna follow you because no one's loved me like you have loved me. I wanna give up leadership of my own life and I wanna trust your leadership of my life. And so if that's you today, maybe for the first time, or maybe today's a rededication of your life to Christ and you wanna come home to the love of Christ, then I want you just to, if you're able to, just bow your head with me right now and just pray this in your heart. If you're driving or something, you're out where you can't, just, just pray this in your heart right now, Lord Jesus, Right now, I want to commit my life to you. I want to trust you with my life. Jesus, you know my brokenness. <laughs> you know the things that have been done to me. But Jesus, you also know the things that I've done to myself. You know my own sin. I ask for your forgiveness and I ask for your healing. What I'm asking for is your redemption. To set me free, to forgive me, to make me whole, to heal me. I need you, Jesus. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for loving me before the world was created. Thank you for caring for me and choosing me, selecting me. I love you in return, Lord, and I trust you with my life. Fill me with your presence. Fill me with your hope. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. I love you, family. Thank you for being with us today. This is week one. I was, but now I am. We'll see you next week. So a couple weeks ago, when Pastor Dan was preaching on generosity, he encouraged us to donate a gently worn or new pair of shoes. This was one great way that we could live out our generosity with our actions, by giving to those who are less fortunate than us.
We did this shoe drive by partnering with Student Choice High Schools, and it was hosted by Harvest Compassion Center that's located here in Phoenix. Now, if you saw Pastor Dan teach live, it was actually quite fun to see him up on stage shoeless. He even had those socks that kind of matched the series as he preached. But as you as a church body responded, I got to see people take off their shoes after service, walk to their cars and their socks after they dropped them in the bins in the lobby. But then the second weekend on Saturday night, we had so many more shoes brought in, our LifeBridge team had to go out and get more containers to put into the lobby because we had hundreds of shoes and socks brought in. Many of those shoes were brand new, even in the packaging. And most of us have never been in a place where just having a decent or a new pair of shoes can actually be a life-changing event. But without ever having walked in their shoes, you leaned in and showed compassion. And we ended up donating eight huge overfilled bins full of shoes. The generosity of our church, both on physical campuses and our online community, continues to amaze me. And I'm so glad to be part of a church community that continues to focus on beyond their own wants, but also the needs of others. One that leans into loving those who are downtrodden. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, God, that as we went through this last series talking about finances, God, I know that I heard from so many people that some they begin to save, they begin to budget, they begin to prepare for emergencies, and for some of them became generous or tithe for the first time or generous in new ways, Heavenly Father. We thank you for those steps as they're leaning into finances in their life. So many times where our money is, our heart is located very close to that, God. And so we thank you that you wanna work in that area of each and every one of our lives. We thank you, Lord, that you're gonna use as people give and pour out those as a blessing to those who are less fortunate, Heavenly Father. We also pray for each and every individual struggling and are having a hard time in their finances, God. Encourage their hearts. Let them not walk and fall in depression. Give them next steps. We pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. So, as you put your tithes and offerings in the mail, as you're giving online, text to give, or in the Pure Heart app, know that these are the types of things that your faithfulness and your generosity is going to support. And thank you, family, for your continued support of Pure Heart and the churches, ministries, and nonprofits that we're getting to partner with as God's expanding our reach in ways we never imagined to reach the nation, the world, letting us have the privilege to stand in the gaps, be in the hands and feet of Christ. So cool. Be encouraged. Have an amazing week. Keep your focus on Him. We continue to love like Christ for the sake of others in new and exciting ways. I'll see you next week.